While there's nothing new under the sun, there is a theistic argument that has gotten surprisingly little attention. Is that because it isn't very compelling? How does the search for truth itself point to the existence of God? If true, this could be the key that rebuffs the wave of deconstruction happening across the Western world. I'm on a search for truth, Sean. Let's see where this goes. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Normally, I like to look at the most popular Christian arguments, but I recently came across some educated men putting forth an argument for Christian-compatible theism that's so terrible that I really wanted to nip it in the bud. Which my guest today, Dr. Neil Shenvey, is going to explain. He's the author of a recent book, Why I Believe... As a disclaimer, I haven't read the book in question as it hasn't been released to the public yet. I'll be responding only to this discussion with Sean McDowell. Dr. Neil Shenby has a PhD in theoretical chemistry from UC Berkeley, with his dissertation on quantum computation. That's legit impressive. In 2010, he suffered a brain tumor, and he retired in 2015 to homeschool his kids. Those are admirable things. Sounds like a very smart, good guy. Neil did not grow up as a Christian, but converted later in life. So I grew up in a very loving and moral household, but it's not a Christian household. So I went to college. Uh, I was kind of spiritual, but not religious. I would have said I was a Christian, but only because I was you know, American. And here Christianity is like the way to believe in God. I believed in God. Neil always believed in a God. So whatever he's going to present today wasn't actually part of his personal truth quest. Did this argument at all play a role in your conversion, or was this more downstream after you became a believer? No, this is downstream. Got it. And then, so in college, uh, I met my future wife, Christina. Uh, so we we went out to graduate school together at UC Berkeley, and my concession was, because I, I really loved her, I was like, I'll start mm. going to church with you. Ah, so Neil is from the Lee Strobel and J. Warner Wallace School of Conversion, where they come to think Christianity is true only after the relationship with a woman prompted the inquiry. I enjoyed Lee Strobel's case for Christ, but I would feel uncomfortable giving it to a professor at mm. a university. Unlike case for Christ, which you said maybe you wouldn't give to a professor, this is more intellectually sophisticated. Ouch. Okay. So you don't want me to compare you to intellectually unsophisticated Lee Strobel. That's fair. This background information doesn't actually reflect on the validity of the argument anyhow. So let's get to it. Well, we're going to jump into what is called the Transcendental Moral Argument. I've not actually seen the Transcendental Moral Argument label used, but Transcendental Arguments are a broad category of arguments for God that some aspect of the universe, be it logic, science, morality, etc., presupposes God, and somehow presupposing this conclusion proves the conclusion. Normally, that would be called begging the question. Okay, I've been looking forward to this for a while because it's in very few apologetics books that I've seen. And let me start with a phrase that you began this section in your book with. You said, one surprising area where atheism falters is in the search for truth. What? Now, let me be the skeptic and say, what? What? Some of my atheist friends care deeply about truth. Right. So I'm not claiming they don't. In fact, I'm going to argue later that that they're, that atheists search for truth and their desire to know truth and Buddhists and Hindus and Christians, all of us innately desire to seek truth. I, I, I grant that. I'm asking which worldview or religion or ideology can explain why that is an obligation of us that we have. Ah, uh, and here's where it is all going to go off the rails. It is not my position nor have I heard any fellow skeptics propose that seeking truth is a moral obligation. I mean, I completely reject the entire concept of moral obligations. Okay, so I was speaking, I can't remember how many years ago, and I was giving a whole talk on truth, and a student came up to me and said, you know, Dr. McDowell, you've been speaking about truth for like an hour. Why is truth even important? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, do you want the true answer or the false answer? And he paused and looked at me and kind of smirked and was like, I got it, and just walked away. Yeah. Something being important isn't remotely the same as that thing being a moral obligation. Spoiler alert, the argument needs obligation to succeed, not mere import. What he didn't realize is in asking that question, he was already deeply committed to truth. 
and can't escape it. I'm going to get repetitive, but deep commitment isn't the same as moral obligation. So it seems to me what you're saying, Christian, atheist, all of us have this intrinsic sense that truth matters. An intrinsic sense that truth matters is not the same as moral obligation. We assume we have a moral obligation to know at least certain truths. Wait, now this moral obligation is limited to certain truths? So, you know, okay. we, we do have this innate desire to know the truth. Now I'm stepping back and asking, okay, if you grant that that desire is there, how is it justified? What, what world you can rationally explain why you have that desire and why it's a good and a right desire for you to have. Because truth is that which conforms to reality and being able to make accurate predictions about reality is a biological survival advantage. It's as simple as that, but we'll get into it later. Now, we're going to come back to some of the premises and I'm going to try to push back and poke holes in it a little bit. Sean was once one of the better theists at pretending to be a skeptic, but ever since his viral video doing so... I think he's become less and less effective in articulating and steel manning his opposition. We'll see. So my, my claim is that uh, we all as human beings have a, a moral obligation to seek the truth. Not every truth. Like I don't have to know how many rocks are in my garden, like odd or even number. It doesn't, doesn't matter. No. But when it comes to certain truths, especially truths about the big questions in life, like does God exist? What is his will for me and for my life? Uh, what, you know, I, those truths, like does God exist? Does he have a, a will for me? Does he have a purpose for my life? that I'm obligated to seek to know those truths. This is a distinction that is presented completely without justification. Though I understand why fellow God believers would nod their heads in affirmation. A primary assertion in Christianity is that our eternal fate rests entirely on our belief about the existence of God. If correct, then morality isn't about the well-being of humans, but rather about the commands of a divine authority. But, without presupposing that this is true, then this is just a story, an assertion. If the Christian God doesn't exist, then there would be no such obligation to form an opinion at all. So, for this argument for God to carry, then one must first assume the conclusion, making the whole thing an exercise in begging the question. Okay, so this distinction is helpful to say that we don't have the obligation to seek every truth. If there's just one truth that yeah. we are morally obligated to seek, then your argument goes through. Just like with intelligent design, you don't have to argue everything is designed. If there's mm -hmm. one thing that's designed, or if there's one miracle, uh, then the argument ideally goes through. I don't disagree, but I'm still waiting to be convinced of one miracle, one bit of nature that's designed. And now, I'm waiting for one truth that we are morally obligated to seek. Again, if you posit that your single example is the God morality obligates us to seek the truth of God, therefore God, then you're begging the question. I'm dealing with one claim in particular, which is what about seeking the truth? Is that is thou shalt seek the truth? Is that true? Do we have an obligation to seek the truth? No, we do not have such an obligation. Again, not any truth, but certain truths about, I'd say, obviously God's existence. Does God exist? Does he have a will for me? Uh, does he have a purpose? Is there a purpose for my life? Those, that, those kind of truths are uh, obligatory to seek. You seem to be acknowledging that. In general, there is no obligation to seek truth, and you have not demonstrated any reason that seeking the truth about God is an exception. Give us sure. the t two premises and conclusion. So the, it would actually, it would, the premises, I set them up like the moral argument, but you're going to hear a little bit of difference. Okay. The premise would be, if a truth-loving God does not exist, then truth is not intrinsically good, and truth-seeking is not morally obligatory. Premise two is, but truth is intrinsically good, and truth-seeking is morally obligatory. Therefore, conclusion, a truth-loving God does exist. There it is. So there's no doubt, as far as I can see, that this is a valid or sound argument. The question is, is each premise true? I suspect Sean misspoke here, but for the record, and for clarity, an argument is valid if the form of the argument is correct. I agree, Neil's argument is valid in that sense. An argument is sound if the form is valid and the premises are, in fact, true, which is the question Sean posits. So from here on out, we're evaluating soundness. Yeah. So what the skeptics are going to have to do is show that one or both of them are not true. That's a complete shift of the burden of proof. It's on Neil to prove they are true, not for anyone else to prove they are false. To top it off, to show that they are not true would require them to have falsification criteria, 
and at no point are falsification criteria provided. As such, all I can do is demonstrate how Neil fails to meet his burden. So let's take these premises one in kind. In the interview, Sean and Neil first went over premise one. But I think it will be helpful and time-saving to look at the second first and then go back. Premise number two now says truth is intrinsically good mm -hmm. and truth-seeking is morally obligatory. So my question would be, how do we know truth is intrinsically good and seeking truth itself is morally obligatory? Defend that claim, premise number two. All right, and the, the, the easiest way to, to show that that claim is true is to simply point out that at, at this point in the conversation, like you did with your student, they've already bought that premise. If they're talking to you about how do I know Christianity is true, they're okay. already sold on that. Why would they even, if you're in the middle of my Got book, it. I'm like, you're on chapter like six right now. If you didn't believe that truth-seeking were, were intrinsically good or worth doing, you wouldn't be reading this book about why Christianity is true. Whoa, whoa, whoa there. You can't just conflate worth doing with intrinsically good and get away with it. Breathing is worth doing, but that doesn't mean that breathing is intrinsically good. Breathing is worth doing because I want to stay alive. Breathing has instrumental value, something that has value as a means to a desired outcome or end. In the same way, truth-seeking has instrumental value, not intrinsic value. Truth-seeking allows us the opportunity to make better informed decisions. Even if I accept Neil's premise that finding out the truth about God is in a special category to itself, determining the existence of God is important only for purely instrumental reasons. To worship him, to obey his commands, and to take steps to get into heaven. Merely having this truth isn't sufficient. The author of the book of James admonishes the idea that the truth about God is of intrinsic value. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that. And shudder. But the fact that you are willing to read this book and wanting to know whether Christianity is true, it shows you that at least implicitly okay. you're endorsing the, this premise. Not at all. I entertain the notion that Christianity is true because it has potential to determine my eternal fate. That is instrumental value the opposite of intrinsic value. The whole free thought movement, one of the attractive features of skepticism and free thought and being a free thinker and then even new atheists, they really seem to want the truth. And their big beef with religion was not that I don't like it. It was always primarily, at least ostensibly, that it's false. Mm -hmm. But again, if they don't think that truth seeking is really a big deal. Thinking that truth seeking is a big deal is not the same as truth seeking has intrinsic value. Winning gold at the Olympics is a big deal. Getting into the college of your choice is a big deal. Having a baby is a big deal. But the value of each is instrumental. Then th why even a new atheist? <laughs> they're, they're, they're presenting themselves as we care about the truth. Great, you're granting from us too. Caring about the truth is not granting that truth seeking has intrinsic value nor that it is a moral obligation for some Christianity defined corner case. You both agreed earlier that even if I adopt your worldview completely, that not all truth-seeking falls into this obligation category, but you're trying to use examples of non-obligatory truth-seeking as proof of obligatory truth-seeking. This does not follow. And with such sloppy argumentation, I'm starting to wonder if even Neil actually believes in this premise. In the same way, if someone comes to you and says you ought to seek the truth, they can either say, I smell a false dichotomy coming our way. Well, no, it's obligatory. And I'm like, okay, I'm listening. I'm listening now because you're saying it's an obligation that all of us have universally. If I just tell you something is an obligation, you just accept me at my word? In your mind, this authoritarian declaration is superior to appeals to reasons and a demonstration of beneficial outcomes? Okay, but if they turn around and say, well, it's just a hobby of my, my subjective preference. Well, I don't care about your preferences. It's great you have your preferences. I have mine. I have my favorite brand of mayonnaise. You have your favorite brand of mayonnaise. But that's not doesn't have any purchase on me. As expected, Neil is ignoring other options besides it's just my preference and an authority makes it so. Most of us would instead make an appeal to common goals, perhaps human flourishing or personal well-being or going to heaven after we die and demonstrate how truth-seeking is instrumental to one of those ends. But so my point is, in many ways, they routinely affirm, and everybody does, you can't, no one consistently just, just despises the truth and tosses it aside. We all want to know the truth, uh, at least at some deep level, and I would say as a- You already know what I'm gonna say. Not despising the truth isn't moral obligation to truth. 
Wanting to know the truth at a deep level isn't moral obligation to truth. Occasionally, you'll meet people that are just, you know, just they, they're like, all I want to do is have a good time. I literally don't want to know if I'm living a lie. That does happen occasionally. Far more often than occasionally, I meet Christians for whom Christianity just works at some level and will openly express that they don't care if Christianity actually conforms with reality. Someone close to me once begged that I not expose them to information that would erode their faith. Is Neil's God gonna punish these Christians for inadequately pursuing justification? Or will he reward them? for faith like a child. And then number two, if you're talking to an atheist, they're often the first people to tell you, no, I want to know what's true and false. Um, I think it's, it can, it's pretty hard to, con to be consistent and deny that truth is good. Say it with me now. Affirming that truth is good in some instrumental sense is not the same as moral obligation to seek truth. And the last thing I'll say is too, is like, if imagine an atheist comes to a Christian and says, you should believe atheism. And I say, hold up, time out. Will it make me a better dancer? Will, will, I, will I earn more money at work? Will I have a, you know, will I, will I um, you know, uh, will it make me uh, have a longer vacation? And they're like, what? And I'm like, well, I, before I know whether or not this is true, I want to know what, what is, what's in it for me. And the atheist will just look at you like you're crazy. And like, well, it's just true. You ought to want to know what's true. I'm like, yes, bingo. <laughs> bingo. 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 Are there really atheists out there talking like this? I would never say that you ought to do anything without a qualifier. If you want to make informed decisions, you ought to seek truth. If you care about what's true, you ought to investigate both sides. Apologists like Neil like to pretend you can have oughts without ifs, but I reject that completely. Without a subjectively chosen goal to compare it to, no action can be evaluated. The problem is that communication is lazy and imprecise. So goals that the majority hold survival, pain avoidance, and well-being of our family or tribe go unexpressed for brevity, allowing Neil and his ilk to capitalize on a perception that unspoken means intrinsic. If I responded to you by demanding what I get out of the truth, you'd immediately start haranguing me, rightly so, but you're assuming then that truth is worth seeking intrinsically, it's intrinsically good. So there you go. Again, you're showing me that you know deep inside that truth seeking is obligatory and that truth is intrinsically good. So Neil's case for an obligation to seek truth and intrinsic value of truth rests entirely on people knowing it deep down. And for the majority of the population who have given their epistemology zero thought, perhaps this rings true. But I've already shown that this moral obligation is question begging. And the benefits of acting upon true propositions over false propositions is so obvious that of course it's going to feel like intuition rather than a conscious decision tree. Truth-seeking itself is a heuristic, and most seek truth only to the extent to which it impacts their lives, which is all the evidence Neil should need to demonstrate that we value truth-seeking as instrumental, not intrinsic. A point he was forced to acknowledge because it is so obvious. It seems like in this premise, when you say, how do we, when I push back and say, how do you know that truth is intrinsically good and seeking truth is more obligatory? Your point is we just know it. We directly right. know it. Like, I guess William Lane Craig would say, if somebody needs an argument uh, that torturing innocent kids for fun is wrong, if they ask you why, you don't need an argument. That person needs a therapist because they're not seeing things as it is. Any mm -hmm. argument for that premise is weaker than the premise itself. Not at all. You and Dr. Craig are merely appealing to evoking emotion. Again, the fact that we have moral heuristics that let us jump quickly to some obvious conclusions doesn't mean that what lies beneath them are not subjectively selected goals. Our visceral desires to not be harmed allow for empathy for others being harmed. Again, Sean and Neil count on people spending no time thinking through their actual epistemology. Right. So to even try to prove how we know truth is intrinsically good and seeking truth is morally obligatory is almost less powerful than the obvious thing we just deeply all know and our lives in some fashion reflect it. If you are the kind of person who takes we just deeply know as justification, you're probably not the kind of person who uses arguments to come to a conclusion about God's existence. Right up front, Neil admitted that he always just believed in a god deep down, and that this argument didn't make him believe. What Neil and Sean are doing 
is constructing a syllogism around intuition in order to seem rational about using their own intuition to determine what's true. But for me, Neil has completely failed to convince me that truth-seeking has intrinsic value in and of itself, rather than just the instrumental value of making informed decisions, satiating curiosity, the satisfaction of achievement, or countless other desirable outcomes. And his one and only example of seeking truth as moral obligation is an obligation to seek truth about God. But this becomes an obligation only if God exists. And so Neil is assuming the conclusion in his premise, begging the question. As premise two fails, we won't have much to say about premise one. Premise number one. Seems like you could push back and ask the question, why is a truth-loving God necessary for truth-seeking to be intrinsically good and morally obligatory? Why do we need God to ground those two things? We don't need to ground what hasn't been demonstrated. The way around premise one of the normal moral argument is is usually the one you kind of most is some form of utilitarianism. The idea that, well, no, I don't need God to ground morality or moral obligation. I can appeal to human flourishing. Like human okay. flourishing will, will, that's what's good. Seeking human flourishing, it's good, it's obligatory. It's all I need, I don't need a God. Close, human flourishing is good to the extent that is our preference. It is not obligatory. No one needs to care about human flourishing. But to the extent that a species doesn't care about flourishing, that species will fail to flourish and will ultimately die out. Natural selection will obviously favor creatures with a will to thrive over creatures without such a will. You're right. We don't need a god for this. And once again, Neil hopes that you haven't thought through the epistemology of your own intuitions. Now, of course, you can respond as a Christian, well, no, why is human flourishing good? If we're just molecules in motion, why should we care about you know, whether we live or die. Again, a species that doesn't care about life or death is at a survival disadvantage. This is grounded in biology. No God required. What's interesting is this particular transcendental moral argument offers you a different response. What you can point out is this. Who is to say that human flourishing is optimized by truth-seeking or by the intrinsic goodness of truth? In fact, what you can show very easily in many cases is that truth-seeking and truth do not align with human flourishing. They're actually enemies. I don't need to hear your example to agree with the idea that truth-seeking is not synonymous with human flourishing. A common illustration is that a creature on the African savanna who assumes that every rustling in the bush is danger and therefore avoids the bush is going to have fewer dangerous encounters than the creature who investigates every rattling bush to find out the truth about the presence of a predator waiting to eat it. Imagine that your grandmother is dying and she's a Christian or believes in God. And she asks you, who, if you're an atheist, well, wait a minute, I, I hear uh, that God doesn't exist. Are you, is that true? Is that what you're telling me? Because the only thing giving me joy and peace and happiness right now is my trust in God who loves me, belief that I'll be with my, you know, my husband and my little children who died. That's what's carrying me through this terrible time on my deathbed. So tell me, Mr. Atheist Grandson, is it true that God doesn't exist? And Coyne says, of course you should lie to her. He says, mm. there's no question because, mm. because all you're going to do is, is make her miserable on her deathbed. There's no upside, so lie to her. First of all, this is a terrible example. Mine was much better because it dealt with the obvious biological well-being, life or death, for the individual as well as for the group, assuming the creature was still of breeding age. Presumably grandma was not, though that's not the important thing here. Neil has conflated individual happiness with human flourishing. And of course, these are not one and the same. In the Sam Harris sense, human flourishing is necessarily the balance of the needs of the many and the needs of the one. For example, when one individual sacrifices themselves to be eaten by a lion so that the rest of his tribe can escape the same fate, the flourishing of the tribe has increased, even though the flourishing of that individual has decreased. But if too many individuals are sacrificing themselves, then there is no tribe to flourish. So the biological need in social species is to balance both. The reason Neil's grandma example is so intuitively obvious is that telling the truth in that scenario would harm an individual with no reasonable potential for increased flourishing. Adding the deathbed part made the decision trivially easy. But 
if the scenario became an atheist telling someone with significant life ahead of them that Christianity was false, then that truth-seeking has the significant potential good of future decades of better informed decisions to balance against the short-term harm of losing comforting faith. If we were to posit human flourishing as myopically as Neil is here, then we would say that exercise is counter-flourishing because it makes my body sore today, while ignoring the long-term benefits that outweigh the short-term discomforts. Now, so the point here is he, he has to admit if human flourishing is your ultimate grounding for morality and for obligation and, and goodness. That is, so he would say moral for, if human flourishing is intrinsically good, while truth is merely instrumentally good, meaning okay. it's good if it gets you to flourishing. Yes, that's exactly what we're saying and what my examples have demonstrated. Truth-seeking's primary value has been in flourishing. Now, as our species developed ways to meet our basic survival needs of food and shelter, our perception of flourishing could expand as well to allow for the pursuit of knowledge in other areas. But the fact that modern humans have largely pulled themselves out of the forces of natural selection doesn't mean that informed decision-making isn't grounded in the natural selection forces at play against our ancestors. Which is to agree. Truth has instrumental value, not intrinsic value. So there's no need to try to ground its intrinsic value. Premise 2 fails, so premise 1 is meaningless. The way I illustrate it in the, the book is I say, if human flourishing is your ultimate good, then are, is smooth jazz music, is that good? And the answer is it depends. If you like smooth jazz, then, and, he, and smooth jazz will, will make you flourish, then smooth jazz is good. But what if you loathe smooth jazz? Well, then smooth jazz is evil because it's, it's reducing, it's subtracting from your flourishing. Personal happiness is not human flourishing. This is a huge mistake on Neil's part. He's fighting a straw man. And my point is, what you do with truth-seeking if you're a utilitarian is, is it becomes an instrumental good. It's good if it can get you to certain things. Maybe it'll get you to, you know, cure world hunger and, and cure diseases and get you to colonize, uh, you know, distant stars. And then truth-seeking is good. But when truth-seeking conflicts with human flourishing, it's got to go. In practice, that description actually affirms our observations of the world. People tend not to seek uncomfortable truths until such time as it affects their survival or well-being. Many refuse to go to doctors or dentists until there is pain. Few elect to study topics that hold no personal interest. Recreational study happens only when survival basics are already met. Every example Neil gives merely affirms the instrumental nature of truth-seeking. What if we just empirically discover that most human beings and societies just can't deal with an atheistic universe. It seems there is reasonable evidence that this is, in fact, the case. And the preference to be comforted by purpose, meaning, and a protector against forces not in our control goes a long way to explaining the proliferation of religious viewpoints over history. What if, the, just psychologically, it's just a fact that most human beings are unhappy. If they, if they, were, if they, were, if they were sure that God didn't exist, they would be sad. They would not flourish. Maybe it's just a fact of, you know, a study could measure it psychologically. Perhaps Neil recognizes his earlier mistake of conflating individual happiness with human flourishing and is so attempting to extrapolate a psychological state across the population. Well, if that were the case, then atheists would have to hide the truth of atheism from as many people as possible, lest they reduce human flourishing. Nope. He reverted back, assuming that short-term psychological discomfort is of greater detriment than the long-term benefit of facing the universe as it actually is. In the world depicted in Star Trek The Next Generation, humanity has set aside reliance on superstition and religion and is a greater species for it. Who is to say we cannot travel that path toward eliminating hunger, labor, and conflict? Cancer cannot be cured without first facing a painful diagnosis. Maybe avoiding the short-term pain is standing in humanity's way. A myopic view of flourishing is all that is keeping Neil's argument together here. Sam Harris does this. If you appeal to yep. that to ground these these truths, this uh, moral obligation, then you can't explain why you shouldn't promote religious lies if they are conducive to human happiness. Well, that's easy because Sam doesn't confuse happiness with flourishing like you do. And second, plenty of non-believers advocate for promoting religious lies to keep the population placated. 
Karl Marx famously observed that religion is the opiate of the masses. A drug-like state of manipulation and control isn't what I would call flourishing. If we concede that human flourishing is an objective good... Flourishing isn't an objective good. It is a subjective goal that is hardwired into creatures that are descended from ancestors who wanted to flourish. Then what happens is not grounding the value of truth-telling as an absolute. Actually, there's times where we should not tell the truth for human flourishing. Only in very short-sighted considerations of human flourishing. If we grant that we ought to care about and have a moral obligation to carry out uh, human flourishing. But with that said, you're arguing that atheism cannot ground even human flourishing being an objective good. It's a subjective good. We're the subjects. In some ultimate sense, the universe is indifferent to human flourishing. Because that is a moral duty in the universe, and it's hard to see where that comes from apart from God. It's incredibly easy to see that this comes from biology. So in one sense, you're saying damned if you do, damned if you don't, from an atheist perspective, trying to count for moral obligation and the intrinsic goodness of truth-telling. I reject a moral obligation for truth-seeking. So I'm definitely not trying to ground it. Yeah, it's a double, double whammy, essentially. Basically, basically okay. let's say that you're you're presenting the moral argument and the atheist is able to successfully argue that he can ground good and bad and right and wrong in a human flourishing. Regardless of worldview, good is the label we use for actions that lead to desired outcomes and bad is the label we use for actions that lead to undesired outcomes. This is no less true for the Christian God than it is for you and me. Let's say he, he is able to do that or able to at least he's convinced he can do that. Okay. Well, then, even if you grant him that, you I'll, for the sake of argument, I'll grant that you can ground the mora moral ob like obligations and, and right and wrong, good and evil in human flourishing. I'll grant you that as an atheist. You still can't ground the goodness of truth and truth-seeking because sometimes truth and truth-seeking don't align with flourishing. That depends entirely on your view of flourishing. They may not mean short-term individual happiness like you do. You probably need to have that conversation first. You have to hide truths from yourself if you're worried they might detract mm. from your flourishing or from flourishing in general. You know, that was my fear when my faith in God was slipping. I was focused on all the things I was losing short term, and the list was long. Ultimately, I do not regret the path as I have gained so much more. I realize this won't be the case for everyone. And acknowledging that people prefer a comforting lie over an inconvenient truth serves only to undermine Neil's point. Truth-seeking is frequently limited by instrumental value. So the example that I use in the book is, you know, if I am happy, I am happy as a Christian, and objectively, I look at my life, it's made me a better person. I, I am more loving. I am a better husband. I, I give more. It's objectively the measure of like how much I give away in terms of money, time, emo, you know. It's a, Christianity has improved my flourishing, and, you know, I think objectively, it's, it's, it's enabled me to help others to be happy too. That would be the topic of another video entirely. But it is not at all obvious that your personal altruism overcomes all the harm a false view brings to society in general, and even to individuals specifically. Neil is also assuming that he is correctly attributing his altruism to Christianity, which he may not be. For now... I'm just going to strongly disagree. If an atheist comes to me and says, you ought to believe the truth of atheism, I say, ought? O I should? Why? That would be the correct question, as there can be no ought without an if. If you want to live a life that conforms to reality, then you ought to seek the truth. If you prioritize comfort and happiness, then you're under no obligation. For me, it was the need to resolve cognitive dissonance that led me to seek truth. I was under no obligation. Because right now, it seems to me like I Christianity is making me flourish, and it's helping me to help other people flourish as well. Again, just because it seems that way to you doesn't mean that it's true. What truth-seeking have you done on that premise? And just as importantly, under what scope and scale of human flourishing? If you mean happiness and comfort of your immediate circle of loved ones, then we're not using this phrase in the same way. So the weird thing is that the atheist, in order to to compel you to seek the truth has to assume the truth is something that we ought to seek. No, all the atheist has to do is demonstrate where truth seeking is consistent with your stated objectives. Why, why think that? That's a good question. Now, what's interesting is Christians, we could actually say, 
speaking the truth, even if it costs you something, leads to human flourishing mm -hmm. because we are better off not just caring for our physical bodies through a lie, but becoming the kind of people that value truth regardless of what happens to us. So there might be a different view of human flourishing. No. Sean allows Neil to go on and on, pretending that the non-believer position is that flourishing is synonymous with personal happiness, and then takes up altruism as what a Christian would call flourishing, and then calling that a difference. It's not a difference. It's incredibly uncharitable. But nonetheless, within Christianity, it carries with it an obligation and a duty to find truth. So that's not in conflict with this argument but it would be within an atheistic worldview. I don't accept truth-seeking as an external obligation, so no conflict. Yeah, I mean, as a Christian, absolutely, I want to know the truth because God commands it, right? And as a non-Christian, I want to know the truth because it more consistently leads to desired outcomes, like flourishing. But what you can't do is you can't come to me as, a, as an atheist who has no grounding for that claim then urge me to, to accept that. Well, why should I? Again, why should, the God. operative word is should. Why am I obligated to? You're absolutely not obligated to seek truth. I would never say you should seek truth, unless you've already agreed with me that you prefer outcomes that are better achieved through truth-seeking. Minds can be changed only in the context of common ground and shared goals. If I don't already believe in a god, you can never convince me to seek the truth on the basis that God commands it. You'd need to take another tact. You know, when I think about an evolutionary explanation for this, it seems that at best evolution could explain why we have certain instincts to mm. tell the truth, because all things considered, truth telling is going to be more conducive to survival, not perfectly, sure. but more conducive to it. But what it can tell us is that we ought to follow yeah. those instincts. And mm. that's the very thing that has to be explained to offer a sufficient naturalistic evolutionary explanation uh, to counter this argument. Until you demonstrate that there is an ought absent an if, there's literally nothing to counter. Right now, someone's rushing to type a comment saying, but Paul, we're talking about ontology, not epistemology. Yeah, so am I. Show me how biological advantage is insufficient ontology for that which we observe. Is ultimately, yeah. in fact, it would just be a subjective explanation, not an objective explanation for moral truth-seeking within itself. Correct. No objective explanation is needed when subjective is sufficient. So I'm curious, in writing your book, Why Believe, why do you think this argument hasn't gotten more traction? Because it begs the question, isn't sound and isn't compelling? I, I honestly can't remember ever running across this argument anywhere else. And I've read a fair bit of apologetic stuff. So yeah, I don't know why it's understudied. Uh, I, I, I ran it by a philosopher that I know. And he said, oh, yeah, it's like, it's like uh, epistemological norms. It's like, well, yeah. Yeah. But he sort of knew that there's a term like that, but he didn't really ever use it as an argument. So I don't know. I, you can tell, you tell me, I don't know. But it's, I'm, I think it deserves a lot more attention than it's, got, it's gotten. I think someone could do a doctoral dissertation on this, <laughs> write a book on this, develop full lectures on this. And I know there's going to be some skeptical pushbacks that would need to be dealt with. Like perhaps those I've presented today. But I'd love to see it get more traction. I think there's something intuitive about it when people get it. I don't understand why theists are so enamored with intuition. Most of the greatest discoveries in the history of humanity have been profoundly counterintuitive. So in many ways, this is a presuppositional argument. Yes, exactly. Now, the very first video I ever created for my channel was specifically about why the entire category of presuppositional arguments fail. But just last week, popular Christian YouTuber Inspiring Philosophy gave his opinion about presuppositional arguments. I mean, it's it's a waste of time. It doesn't. I have seen it very. I've seen it. It does not work on a lot of atheists, especially in today's culture. Maybe one or two. I, maybe there are some testimonies somewhere where it worked on somebody, but I have seen very few. And if you talk to atheists or you listen to some of their hangouts, which I have, um, I've listened to some of their hangouts where they're just doing stuff on YouTube. Presuppositional apologetics is a joke to them. It is hilarious. They love laughing about it. Do you really want to play their game? Okay, it does not work. They do not take it seriously. Get out of it. Let's just move on. You may be convinced by it personally, but if your apologetic needs to actually be affecting the culture, and presuppositional apologetics does not. I'm sorry if that hurts. Get on with it.
Ooh, there's not much this atheist could say that could ring more loudly in the ears of a Christian apologist than that. Listen to Michael. So if some naturalists respond, and I suspect some will, maybe you and I will come back on and interact with those, or maybe we'll just push it off and let some apologist jump in and engage this conversation. Hmm. But I would love to see more conversation about this apologetic question. It hasn't gotten near enough coverage. Well, Sean and Neil, while I think it's highly unlikely that you'll interact with the thoughts presented in this video, I hope that you do. In fact, I'm open to having a live discussion with either or both of you about this argument from truth-seeking at your earliest convenience, on my live channel, or Sean's channel, or some other third-party channel. Contact me and we'll set it up. I just don't see how this stands up to actual skeptical scrutiny, but I'm happy for either or both of you to show me that I'm wrong. After all, even though I am under no obligation to do so, I am seeking the truth. Until next time, later.